Okay. Right, good afternoon everyone. Very warm welcome to our um, CQC session on Now, Next and Future. Um, my name's Kate Taroni, I'm the Chief Inspector of Adult Social Care and I'm going to be taking us through this presentation today. We have an hour together, so the plan is that I'm going to cover some slides. We're then going to have an opportunity to have um, some questions. I'm then going to do another set of slides and then we're going to have some questions at the end. So because this is a Teams live event, we can't because of the number of you that are on uh, this webinar. We can't have an interactive session in terms of you talking, but I've got my chat box open and it would be fab uh, as I talk for you to be writing comments and questions um, uh, as we go. So I will endeavour to multitask in terms of talking and keeping an eye on uh, what you're saying in the chat box. So say hello and let me know what you're thinking in response to what I'm saying. So if we could have the next slide, please, Steph. OK, so who's on the call? So I've introduced myself. Um, I'm really pleased to be joined by Mary Cridge, who's one of my three deputy chief inspectors. Mary covers uh, Central Region. And then we have the team of colleagues who makes this event happen. So we've got Jen, um, Abigail and Steph, who will be uh, keeping an eye on your um, your chat, but also uh, driving the slide deck for me and capturing the themes of what we discussed today. Done. Thank you. So, um, so what we're going to cover today. So I'm going to very briefly remind you of our role and purpose here in CQC. I'm going to talk to you about our timeline, about how we are changing and where we are with that. I'm going to do a super quick recap of what we've done so far in adult social care since the start of the pandemic. I'm going to talk a bit about where we are now with regard to infection prevention control, uh, winter, um, some piloting we're doing around how we might uh, regulate um, home care a bit differently. And then I'm going to talk about our transitional approach to regulation. So that's the first half of the session. And then we're going to have questions and then we're going to move on and talk about how does all of this link to our strategy and the direction of, uh, that we're going in a CQC uh, and what, what the future may hold. And then we're going to have some further uh, further opportunity for questions. So that's the plan uh, for the hour. OK, so if you're on this call, I'm guessing you have a pretty good idea of what we do already. Uh, but just to remind you that we at CQC are the independent regulator of health and social care in England. And our job is to make sure that people receive effective, uh, high quality, uh, compassionate um, care. So our, our role and purpose is not changing. And um, I would say that our purpose is, is as vital as, as ever um, as we've as we've gone through this pandemic and we look at the changing health and social care landscape. So um, to ensure that we continue to deliver uh, what the public expects of us as a regulator, um, we need to ensure that the voice of people who receive services continues to be centre of everything we do and that they have the ability to make a difference to the safety and quality um, out there. Uh, we want to do more around supporting providers to have real time information about how they're doing, uh, to have an adult to adult relationship with, with providers um, and to ensure that all of our interactions are transparent and open with that uh, mutual respect that you would expect. I'm interested in thinking about how we might do more around improvement and how we uh, make learning a part of all of our usual business. Um, so our purpose uh, is not changing and these are the key things that we're, we're looking at. You want to move us on Steph? OK, so we've got a timeline slide that's all oh, that's uh, magically uh, appearing before my eyes. So um, so this is our timeline around uh, transformation and there's a few things that get that's going on. So our, our current strategy is due to end in um, April, May next year. So before the pandemic, we had started thinking about what should be our future direction of travel as a regulator? How do we remain relevant? How do we use all the intelligence that's available to us to have the best, most up to date view of quality? and risk. So we were we were on a plan, we were on a pathway around uh, thinking about how we might want to transform and work differently. 
And then as with many, uh, pretty much every other organisation out there, COVID landed and it required us to very rapidly think about how we needed to do business differently. And what this timeline shows is that we are doing business differently, but we are endeavouring to transform in the direction of where our strategy was taking us anyway. So um, we started scoping and thinking about our strategy um, back in 2019. Um, in uh, at the start of this year, um, our strategic priorities were developed following a series of engagement, and then coupled with that, as we went into uh, April May time, we uh, developed our emergency support framework, which you'll probably be familiar with. Where we are now in autumn is that we are uh, progressing our emergency support framework and moving into a transitional phase. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about our new um, transitional uh, regulatory approach. We have got a really sh real sharp focus around infection prevention and control. And then on our strategic side of things, we are testing out our strategic themes uh, with people uh, in this kind of informal run up to our, our consultation launching um, in the new calendar year. So we are having an early conversation with you all. And it is a conversation because many of these things haven't been uh, finalised or landed yet, as you would have expected at this point. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit later on in the hour as well. Um, our intention is to go out and consult formally on our new strategy um, in springtime and that we launch our new strategy in, in May of next year. So we're doing the dual piece of thinking about how we need to transform as, as an organisation and what our strategic direction is while we transform the way we, we regulate um, in response to what COVID has presented us. OK. So very quick recap around uh, emergency support framework. So you'll remember it feels like an absolute lifetime ago uh, when we made the decision at the start of the pandemic to stop, to pause our routine uh, programme of inspections and instead to place an increasing emphasis on having supportive conversations with providers to ensure that they were as ready as possible for what the pandemic was about to uh, bring. So we had prior to the emergency support framework, we had conversations with thousands of providers where inspectors rang up registered managers and talked to them about the emerging guidance, um, issues around uh, getting access to personal protective equipment, issues around testing and around uh, staff self-isolating or being off sick. So those were the early themes that we heard in our conversations with, um, with the sector. We then developed a structured way of having monitoring conversations with our providers, which is this emergency support framework. And the purpose of that was absolutely about support. And when I've done these calls before, I've generally heard uh, positive feedback from providers about how they experience working with us uh, with the emergency support framework. But I am keen as ever to hear what your experiences are. So as I'm talking, you want to be busily typing away in the chat box about how you found that and any feedback on how we work together in the early days of the pandemic. That's really useful learning uh, for us as well. So please, please share. But the plan for the emergency support framework was supportive conversations with uh, registered uh, managers. Uh, it was an opportunity for us to identify what the emerging issues were for those providers and to help them get targeted support. So in those early days, there was a lot of conversation about getting access to PPE, uh, us having conversation with local resilience forums, in some instances, um, supporting providers to share personal protective equipment with amongst themselves. Um, but we were also escalating those issues up nationally. So we uh, did our first insights publication in May time, which was pretty heavily adult social care focused. And it talked about those main issues that were coming out from our regulatory conversations with providers around PPE, uh, testing and, and staffing. Um, so uh, we developed our emergency support framework. I'm going to give you some figures in a minute as to how uh, many providers we've had those structured monitoring conversations with and our emergency support framework, all the learning we took from putting those structured conversations into, uh, into our computer system that helped uh, generate uh, a kind of an output that, that gave us a new kind of um, technology fun functionality that we didn't have before. And all of that is going to be useful for our, our, our transitional approach around how we regulate. Um, so if we can just move on to the next slide, Steph. OK, so there have been almost 17 and a half thousand locations who have had an emergency support framework um, assessment. Um, and we're calling these regulatory actions. So, so they are um, an intervention, a, a, an exchange that we've had with a provider um, to give assurance and provide support about what's happening um, out there. Um, what you'll see as well is it's slightly pale, but hopefully you can see the uh, bar chart on the right of the slide um, that says that actually 
we endeavoured through the start of the pandemic to get as much information as we could without needing to go and physically visit services in person because at that time it was about supporting providers to get on and do what they they needed to do um but we always said that we would go out and, and physically visit a service when the risk required us to do so. So um, we have undertaken uh, 1,200 inspections in adult social care since uh, the beginning of the financial year, since April. Um, and the number for October is significantly increased since this bar charts um, being produced as well. So emergency support framework was our main way of having visibility and providing support to the sector. Um, and we continue to go out across the threshold when we were um, uh, concerned about risk and we needed to have a look at what's going on out there. Should we move on? Okay, so um, we're involving, evolving the way that we work as all of you, as every single uh, business has had to do in this country uh, as a result of um, as a result of COVID. I'm going to talk to you a bit more about our increasing focus on uh, infection prevention and control. We are developing a transitional regulatory approach that's happening now and our staff are currently being training are being trained in it. Um, and all of that, all of that learning uh, from uh, the first wave of the pandemic and this new way of regulating is informing our strategic direction and um, our, our document that we will be consulting on formally in the new year. Let's move on, Steph. Okay, so infection prevention control, uh, something that was uh, has always been important, but is under the most critical spotlight um, now. So earlier on in the summer, we developed a new methodology focused around infection prevention control. We developed it, we shared it uh, with providers. It's on our website, so if you want to have a look, it shows the eight areas of assurance that we uh, plan to cover or we do cover during infection prevention control um, inspections. It says that the it, it shows providers what we expect to see uh, under each of those uh, as to what is best practice. We have undertaken uh, in excess of 400 infection prevention control inspections uh, since we launched this new uh, methodology. And um, we've gone about it in two ways. So one, we obviously need to respond to risk when it comes to infection prevention control. And when we have concerns brought to our attention around uh, maybe from whistleblowers or for people who receive care of their families, highlighting possibly a provider struggling around good infection prevention control, we go out and have a look in person. So we go across the threshold where we have concerns about the risk around infection prevention control but also we were really keen to do a bespoke piece of work to say what does best practice look like we want to see where providers are you know an absolutely fantastic job around implementing good infection prevention control so we did 300 inspections over the summer where we went out to good services and we were assured in 90% of the, the cases about what we were seeing around um, IPC practice um, so we've done that. Our intention uh, is to do uh, about 500 uh, more infection prevention control inspections um, in the next few weeks, running up to the end of November. Again, with that dual focus, one is going out and responding to risk where we have some concerns, and the other is seeking best practice so that we can we can publish it in terms of individual providers' reports, but also we can bring that together and talk about it in in a national report. And this is what it looks like on our website. So when we go out and do an IPC inspection, we publish a short report, but also to support um, making this as accessible as possible for maybe a member of the public who's looking at what their local uh, care home uh, may be providing on this front. We've developed developed a, uh, a graphic that you can see in front of you that shows the headline of what we've seen when we've gone out and looked across the eight areas of assurance. And what we are doing is where we're assured, you're getting the green tick and the word assured. When we are partially or somewhat assured, um, that can often be a small amendment that a provider might need to make in terms of a policy um, or, or making a small change for us to then be assured and then when we're not assured there are uh, actions agreed to ensure that that is addressed so 400 have been undertaken have been completed and are on our website with this graphic and this is how we will continue to show them as we go out and do the 500. So this is just a breakdown of um, what we found across those eight areas of, of assurance. So um, there are 
many things that are working really well um, out there. So we, we've been really pleased by what we've seen in terms of providers approach around things such as safe admission, um, good infection prevention control to support visitors coming in and people uh, going out of the service and coming back in, um, access to testing, etc. And then the, the areas that have found, we found more areas of concern and improvement is around still being as vigilant as ever about the use of good personal protective equipment. So we're all weary, you know, it's been an incredibly long uh, eight months with uh, a kind of turmoil that no one could have, ever have imagined. And uh, many of you that are on this webinar would have experienced this more than, than you know, other people out, out there. Um, but that message around uh, being absolutely vigilant when it comes to PPE is critical and it's critical that we don't stop talking about it. And then the final area, which is something that I would implore you if you've not done already, is to make sure that your IPC policy um, is up to date and is uh, reflective of the current times we're in. So that's what we've seen um, when we've gone out to that relatively small number of homes. Um, IPC will continue to be a focus. So we've got a plan for 500 in the next kind of four or five weeks. Um, IPC is a focus of our regulatory conversations with you, monitoring conversations with you over the phone, but also I anticipate the IPC focus continuing uh, well into spring. So um, obviously this is not going away because it's such a critical issue and we uh, as the regulator will continue to play our role in providing assurance to, to the public on that. If you can move, move us on Steph. Um, so I'd like to say just a couple of other things uh, around IPC before I move on. Um, one, um, because uh, I don't get these opportunity very often, I want to say an absolute heartfelt thank you to you um, as frontline workers, as managers, as uh, people running care services for what you've done um, to date, we always knew we had a remarkable um, social care sector and workforce, but our, you know, the social care workforce has done more than what we could have ever imagined uh, prior to the pandemic. And I just want to say a massive thank you. Um, you know, most of the country was shutting up shop at the start of the pandemic and our care workers were going out, visiting people in their homes, uh, spending, you know, going into care homes with all, all the risks that was being talked about at the time. And I, I want to say a massive thank you for what you and your teams have done. Um, a couple of other kind of hot topics around this infection prevention control um, uh, agenda that I just want to flag with you that I've talked a bit about in the last couple of weeks, but just in case you've missed it. Um, myself and Ted Baker, who's the Chief Inspector of Hospitals, um, and Rosie Bennyworth, who's the Chief Inspector of um, Primary Medical Services, uh, put out a position maybe about two weeks ago about our expectations around discharge planning. So in our uh, in our piece, um, Ted Baker talked about his expectations about good discharge planning from a hospital perspective, starting early, and that as the person approaches uh, discharge, their COVID status is absolutely known um, at the point that they are ready to leave hospital, and that that information is made available for providers to make an informed decision about whether they can take them into their care and, and look after them uh, in a way that is safe. I talked about my absolute support for um, care providers to not accept someone unless they know their, their, their COVID status and they can absolutely be assured that they can provide good quality um, IPC. And Rosie talked about the importance of that community health offer so that social care providers are not left in isolation, managing people with very complex needs. So we've put our, our kind of collective position on this and want to um, really encourage you to give us feedback on how it's feeling uh, feeling like out there. But I am really hopeful that you have heard from me that you have my backing, our backing as a regulator, that you need to be absolutely assured that you can safely manage someone before um, you move them into their service. I know it's obvious. I know that's what you do anyway. I am just very aware of the pressure in the system, pressure from hospitals, pressure from uh, maybe commissioners, etc all for the right reasons, but I just want you to know we're coming out and regulating social care providers to ensure they're taking, they're delivering good IPC and we want to also support you to make sure you've got what you need to deliver that. And then my final other message on this is um, visiting. 
So um, lots and lots of providers did what was completely understandable at the start of the pandemic. None of us knew what we were facing and many providers took the decision to uh, in effect shut their doors to anyone who, were, who wasn't their, their kind of key members of staff coming in to keep the service safe. Completely understandable. I think we all know and then and then loads of wonderful innovation that you all did to keep people connected to their loved ones. Um, Eight months have gone by. I think we are all acutely aware of the impact uh, this has had on uh, people not being able to see their loved ones as regularly or even at, at all. And we're really keen for all providers to hear that our expectation is you follow government guidelines, you pay sufficient attention to your local risk levels and your advice from your directors of public health, but that we absolutely want to see a person-centered approach to making visiting happen wherever it is safe to do so. So, um, you know, I often think if this, if I was a resident of a care home and this was my last 12 months on, on the planet, um, how, how, my, how might I want to be supported? And that incredibly tricky balance that social care providers juggle every day about safety and keeping people physically safe, uh, weighing it up with keeping them mentally well and um, supporting them to have that kind of uh, family life piece. So I, I just wanted to flag to you as well. We've also made our, our you know, our position on visiting that I know lots of you are talking about um, uh, kind of clear as well, I hope. OK, shall we move on, please, Jen? A um, couple of other bits before I pause for um, questions. So uh, as we weren't crossing the threshold as much um, during the start of the pandemic, our need to hear directly from people about the experience of receiving care was more important than ever. So we, along with Healthwatch England and about 10 partner organisations, uh, launched our Because We All Care campaign in, I think it was August, where um, we, uh, our pitch was, uh, if you uh, if you care about your local health and social care providers and you want them to deliver good care, any way that you can help that happen is by telling us about your experience of care, be that good, bad or mixed. Um, we have been delighted to see a significant increase in the number of people who have given us feedback on care. And actually a large number of occasions when we actually go out and cross the threshold is as a result of that intelligence that's provided to us through uh, forums such as Give Feedback on Care. So this, this feedback absolutely counts to us having um, as up to date a view as possible about the quality and risk that's out there in the sector. We're also um, doing some testing. So I've been talking a bit care homes. So um, if you're a home care provider on this call, thank you for, for bearing with me. Um, so we've been thinking about uh, what, what did we learn from those first few months of COVID in terms of how how could we how we, how were we still able to gather intelligence that gave us gave us confidence about the quality of care that was happening there, and actually we found um, that there was a huge wealth of information available to us and uh, information we could get through those fantastic conversations we were having with managers um, to give us a really good view of what was happening. That's not to say we won't carry on crossing the threshold um, because it's still a really important part of how how we work. But it did get us thinking about home care providers and UKHCA, um, uh, Jane and Colin uh, and I had an early conversation to say actually with a home care inspection, uh, my inspectors will go out, they'll go to the registered office. Um, I've been on these inspections before where you often end up sat in a you know, small room, uh, maybe see a couple of members of staff, but actually because care is being out there delivered in people's home, um, there is a question about uh, whether that is the way we need to uh, inspect home care providers. So we are doing a pilot at the moment. We were delighted. We put the offer out there to home care uh, providers saying, do you want to try a new way of uh, inspecting? 180 organisations come forward and we are doing a pilot with 60 of those um, at the moment spread across the country. And this pilot is to look at if we're not spending time traveling to an office location, how might we increase our amount of activity in talking to staff, maybe when they're away from the office? So might that aid having really frank conversations? And critically, uh, how do we spend more of that time talking to people who receive services via Zoom or Skype in their own home to hear about how that's going? So that pilot is underway. Uh, it's early days, but we're getting fee good feedback so far. And this is a perfect concrete example where in partnership with you, we're saying let's test out a new way of working, let's evaluate it, 
And if it works, might that might we want to seal that in as, as being part of the way we do business going forward? So actually, for home care providers, if if this works and we evaluate it and there's full, you know, there, there's good support for it, might we say that we don't automatically go and visit a home care office when we need to inspect? That actually, in the majority of cases, we can achieve what we need through this route, um, but we will always keep the ability to to go out and visit a place in person if that's what's required. Okay, should we move on? Um, so when we go out and cross the threshold and come and uh, visit you, um, and when we are thinking about our transitional approach to regulation, um, there is an increased focus on monitoring, but also we are continuing to base this on our key, key lines of inquiry. However, when we are out and inspecting, be that targeted or focused, it, it's not going to be, it's not the full comprehensive, so it's not going to be the long reports that you are uh, used to receiving. It's going to be much more targeted in what we are looking at and we are only going to be doing the activity with you as a provider in person that is essential. Everything else that can be gathered without being there in person would be the way that we would look to do it going forward. And let's move on, Steph. Um, so yes, yeah, so our, our, our emergency support framework, uh, we are building on our learning from that uh, with infection prevention control uh, is, is key focus, um, as I've said over the summer and will be through into this autumn. Um, we're doing some work around provider collaboration reviews that I won't go into um, because of time, but we have in 11 systems across the country, we've gone out and looked at what are the ingredients for supporting health and social care providers to come together and collaborate and effectively um, uh, get through the pandemic together, understanding the population, prioritising resources, etc. Um, our relationship with providers, from our perspective, when I talk to inspectors, I'm hearing that it's, it's been strengthened through the way we've been working over the last eight months. Would love to hear whether that is your um, whether that's your perception as well. Um, and a lot of our activity, as you would expect, is being driven by risk. Um, and if we move on, Steph. Um, so because we're responding to risk, uh, gone are the days now of our um, activity being driven by the previous rating. So we are going out and crossing the threshold when the risk requires it or when we're doing a specific piece of work such as infection prevention uh, and control. We need to go out across the threshold when, when the risk uh, requires us to do so. But um, in the near future, we will not be looking at a return to the previous rating being the driver for when we cross the threshold. We want to, our aspiration and, and our strategy is very much about how, how does an always on view of what's happening in a service help us constantly reprioritize when we need to be going out and looking at a service in person. And the final slide, I think, and I, I know, um, uh, the question of ratings has cropped up. I've, I've certainly heard from a number of trade associations and providers questions about rating. I think there is a, an absolute acknowledgement that our collective focus needs to be on risk and managing risk at the moment. Um, but I know that for some parts of the country, there are some providers who are sitting there as it requires improvement, absolutely confident that they're delivering good care. And if we came back out again, that's what we'd see in parts of the country where maybe commissioners don't commission services from requires improvement um, providers. Um, and therefore that has an impact on the capacity in the area. And you could argue impacts on things like people being supported to leave hospital in a timely way. So we are um, we are thinking about where we might be able to go out and do uh, some re-ratings in those sorts of instances where it might, by a re-rating, re where it might lead to an increase in capacity in the system. But also when we go out and do a focused and targeted inspection, when we have the need to look across the, the key lines of inquiry, that, would, that, that could lead to a change of rating, but that's not our main driver um, at the moment. And then I think we're on to question time now, Steph. So um, I absolutely haven't been able to read all your fabulous comments as I've been talking. I can see that there's lots going on. Quite a lot are anonymous. It'd be fab if you wanted to put who you were as well. Just uh, so at first glance, it gives you gives us a glimmer of who's asking uh, the questions. Um, how do we how do you want so so we've got some questions for you how have you found ESF you've been telling me I can see there's lots of comments around IPC etc um Mary you've been busy keeping a bit of a check on what's going on in the chat do you want to just give a couple of reflections on, on what the themes are and um, that's coming through if I can throw over the red teams live box to Mary that would be great
Can I do that, Steph? Are we able to? Yeah, great. Yes, sorry. Yes, sorry. You're live, Mary. Okay, okay thank, you. thank you. I couldn't tell. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so there's been lots of questions. So um, there have been some questions around the IPC inspection, some detail about that, which I'm in the process of answering. Um, so one of the re recent questions was whether they're announced or not. And uh, if they're risk based, they'll be announced from the car park. So uh, quite, a, quite a short notice um, announcement. If not risk based, then there'll be a bit more notice. Um, there's some questions around um, what advice we have for domiciliary care providers. So we need to have a have a look at and, a, and address that point. There have been some positive in the majority sort of positive reflections about um, how relationships with inspectors have improved, but that hasn't been universal experience. And there are some colleagues on from primary medical care who didn't who didn't have the same positive experience in the early days of ESF. Uh, lots of questions about the future. So some responses I've given are have been about waiting for um, the, the the strategy um, information that's coming. But um, definitely uh, the message is we are learning from ESF and yes, we want we also are learning and uh, all the time about the benefits of a positive relationship in terms of achieving what we all want in terms of quality and safety. And that is very much part of our our strategy thinking. So I think that's that's a few of the themes, Kate. Great. I can't remember, Steph, whether I could be heard while the red box moves back to me, but I'm going to talk. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's very quick as well. Um, thanks very much, Mary. And I'm just thinking the, the only other thing I didn't mention that might be of relevance, but ma mainly to care home providers, is um, you'll be aware uh, probably about an active discussion going on at the moment as the government talks to local government about implementing uh, designation areas for people who have a COVID positive uh, test result um, who are being discharged from hospital. So we are uh, we are here and involved with that work and our role is when local authorities in partnership with their um, other system leaders um, identify where a designated space might be, we will go out in response to that and undertake an, an IPC inspection, uh, which would be our normal methodology, but there'll be an increased focus on the ability for that provider or that service to zone and cohort those people that would be coming in with a known COVID status. So just to let you know, we're, we're involved with that piece of work. That's um, Those places are being identified as we speak and local authorities are getting in touch with us as well. Um, one uh, just one comment I saw, which I know is a bit of a hot topic. I'm just going to cover off and then we'll move on with the slides. Um, testing of inspectors. I, I, I hear from my inspectors and I hear from you um, these questions uh, often about inspectors getting tested. Um, so a couple of things. One, um, we have asked the Department of Health and Social Care for this to happen and their view is that uh, our inspectors along with other visiting health and social care professionals don't meet the criteria for getting tested because we're not delivering hands-on care um, but the department's keeping that under review and then secondly I just want to reassure you all the um, robust way that we go about supporting our inspectors so they've all had training around infection prevention and control they've all got the right kit they undertake individual risk assessments for inspections that they're undertaking so we are taking Taking our contribution to it very seriously as well about making sure that our inspectors have all the right knowledge and kit to ensure that they are going out safely into services as well. OK, shall we move on, Steph, with the next um, slide? So we're going to talk a bit about strategy. So all of that, that's all the busy activity we've been collectively doing to transform during COVID. How does that now translate to the type of regulator we, we want to be? And I, I would suggest and happy to hear what you think in terms of how aligned it is. It certainly feels for me like we are motoring in the direction that feels in keeping with our ambition about what we want to do. But let me walk you through. We've got kind of four pillars of our strategy that we're having a conversation about this autumn. And I'm just going to give you the headlines of each of these and would love to hear um, your thoughts. So if we go to the next slide. OK, so we're going to talk about the first pillar, which is people. 
Um, and uh, those of you who uh, may know me will know that I'm a really big fan of Think Local, Act Personal's Making It Real I statements. And uh, the I statements have been compiled with a large number of voices of people who um, experience using services. And they talk about people's expectations about what services should look like. So I think the I statements are a fantastic source of, uh, you know, whenever you need somewhere to go, I think a starting point of the I, of the I statements is critical. Um, and what we want to do as a regulator is we want to we want to regulate services through the, the lens of people who receive them. So we know that uh, the outcomes people get from health and social care are significantly impacted by their ability to access them in a timely way, but also for the ability for those health and social care services to join up in a kind of holistic way around the person. So, so our ambition is to uh, regulate in the way that matters to people and from their, their perspectives, looking at access and how they move between um, services. Um, we want the information we make available to empower people to make decisions about their care, but also more than maybe we've done before. So we have our ability to publish reports uh, called our independent voice. So um, we publish state of care on Friday uh, and it, we publish that annually and that's our annual report about the state of health and social care in the country. Um, but we think in our new strategy we should have a greater role in calling out inequalities. So in our state of care report um, this year we talked about how um, Covid has just magnified those inequalities that existed prior to the pandemic and things such as um, different people's experiences of accessing care, things such as the fantastic digital transformation that has happened across health and social care. You know, that's great for a lot of people, but actually for some groups of people that that won't work for them. Um, so we think we've got a role about calling out inequalities and shining a spotlight where that needs to be um, addressed. So that's a bit about people. Let's move on, Steph, to SMART. Um, so we want to be uh, we want to be a really proportionate regulator um, and we want to um, I, every time I say this expression, it makes me kind of cringe, but I can't think of a better way of saying it. We want to have the right range of tools in our toolbox so that we we've got the right way of regulating the, the different types of services and the types of risk uh, that we've we've got. So we want to have a much more flexible way uh, of regulating uh, with a with a wider range of tools available. Uh, we want to make best use of what's available um, through intelligence and digitally. Uh, we want to use that information to help drive our inspection activity. We want to target our resources to where the risk is um, and we want to make sure we're really proportionate and effective when we go out um, and we want to be flexible and responsive. So, so things such as our um, home care pilot, things such as our IPC new methodology when we go in with a real laser focus, um, I see those as being in our collection of things that we're able to do going forward. So this is about being flexible, smart and proportionate in how we regulate services. And let's move on to SAFE. Um, so safety across health and social care is often the poorest area um, of performance. Um, and uh, Ted, my colleague in hospitals, will say that there hasn't been a significant shift on the safety area for at least 20 years in, 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 from a health perspective. So we want to see um, we want to see things, things significantly shift uh, on the safety front. We want to see a stronger focus on safety culture. In um, adult social care, it's, it's a figure that's stuck in my head from a little while ago, but I, I think it shows this, uh, gives this example quite well. So. Um, in, uh, in health services, there are approximately 237 million medication errors reported a year, so 237 million. In social care land, when uh, prior to COVID, when you used to complete your provider information returns, 50% uh, of those provider information returns ish show that there was no medication errors that happened. Now, that gets me thinking about, are we consistent in spotting when an error has happened, recognising it, uh, recording it and then squeezing all the learning we need out from it so that it doesn't happen again. So, so this strand is about how we as a regulator can really um, really move the dial on safety. And then my uh, contribution when we were having these discussions about this component as well is I feel like safety can sometimes feel a bit paternalistic and in social care 
Um, I think we're all about equality and working um, on an equal footing with people who receive services. So I'm really keen that when we talk about safety and social care, we talk about people um, owning the information, understanding the risk and being supported to make the decisions that are right for them as well. So um, that's a bit about safety. And then if we move on to the last one, which is about improve. Um, so when we think about improvement, uh, and we think about the improvement offer across health and social care, it is very mixed. Um, and I think that adult social care has the least on offer when it comes to improvement, depending on the type of organisation you sit in and the part of the country you're in. So if you're part of a large organisation, you may have your own um, audit and quality team. Um, if you sit in a certain part of the country, you may have a fantastic local authority quality monitoring team and you might have a great um, community health support team that comes in, um, etc. But it's not consistent. I don't think there's a consistent offer for social care providers when it comes to improvement. And I think we need to change that because I think everyone Everyone accessing social care deserves to get good and outstanding care. And I don't think our job as a regulator is to just sit back and comment on the fact that um, a, a, you know, a number of people are receiving care that is less than good. I think we should have a more proactive role in helping uh, that be addressed. So this is a perfect example of the strategy where our thoughts are not fully formed yet. Um, and we really want to know what you think this could look like. So if I just give you my thinking on it and then we'd love to hear your thoughts. So um, I think some inspectors have a kind of supportive before COVID. Um, I think there's a lot more since COVID, but before COVID, I think some inspectors have that sitting alongside a provider kind of vibe. You know, we're in this together. Show me what you're doing well. Let me give you some direct feedback of what you could do, be doing better. Um, I'm really interested in the concept of what would it look like if an inspector had a much more coaching style where they consistently sat shoulder by shoulder with a provider and supported that provider to improve, noting that there will always be a small number of providers where that wouldn't work. And that for those providers that aren't willing or aren't able to engage in uh, trying to do better, there's, there's a different way of needing to work. But for most providers, most providers are eager to do the best, you know, deliver the best quality care for the people they support. So I'm interested in what it might look like if inspectors had more of a coaching style. Um, I'm interested in what it might look like if CQC were the convener of the improvement offer. So if we were to map out, where do you go to uh, for improvement support around, you know, skills for care, about training or think local app personal and sky about what the best innovation practices are. Where are the gaps when it comes to an improvement offer in social care? Um, and what could be our role in saying this gap needs to be filled? And then on an individual kind of with a provider basis, help that provider ac access and um, support. And the reason why I said this, I did a webinar similar to this, maybe, I don't know, a couple of months ago, and a, um, a, a new registered manager was on the chat and she said she'd recently become a registered manager of a requires improvement service in a really small organisation um, and she had no idea where to turn for improvement support. And my ambition, if we were to do this, is that that doesn't happen. My ambition is that there is a consistent improvement offer to every social care provider in the country. Um, but I know that's quite a big ambition and you might think that's not our role. So I would love to hear your thoughts in the chat or when you formally uh, when you give us feedback on, on our strategy uh, engagement document to say what would be of most value to you when it comes to improvement is there a gap is it the regulator's job um, do you think it's a blur blurring the line if I say my inspector should be should have a coaching style would it be welcomed uh, just would really love to hear what you think about those ideas because this out of all the pillars of the strategy this is the one that I think is most up for kind of debate and negotiation because I don't think there is a consensus about what this should look like. Bab, should we move on, Steph? OK, so I'm drawing to a close and we're going to um, just uh, in a minute, I'll go back to Mary for kind of com uh, kind of summary of what you're saying on, on the chat as well as having a quick look myself. So um, as I said, we're, we're developing our transitional approach, our way of having structured monitoring conversations that are built on our emergency support framework. We'll carry on doing IPC inspections. We'll carry on inspecting risk. We've got our home care pilot. 
and we're currently engaging on this strategy now so um get involved give us your thoughts we'll formally consult on it and in january but now is now is a really good window to also let us know what you think is missing or are we heading in the right direction to give you um the support you need to do the the great job you're out there they're doing so that's next and then the next slide for future so we'll have our consultation and then uh, and where we'll publish our strategy um, and this new strategy will go live in uh, May 2021 and, and get involved. Um, and we've got our online platform. We've got many ways uh, for you to uh, hopefully engage and talk to us on it. So so please, um, please get involved. And then the final slide, Steph. OK, so I'm going to have a sip of water and I'm going to throw the red box. Uh, back over to Mary uh, while I have a little read through of your comments about uh, any reflections you've got in response to that strategy and the strategy slides. OK, okay. thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Um, so a range of. Um, it would help if I took myself off mute, wouldn't it? Apologies, people. So um, a range of um, topics uh, coming through in the questions, 108 questions so far. Um, there's a sense that Dom care are feeling forgotten about, okay. um, that our focus is very much at the moment on residential care and um, a, a sense of um, does the guidance that we're giving for residential settings, how does that fit with Dom care? So there's a qu quite a swell of questions and views around Dom care. There's some questions about ratings. Are we still going to keep the ratings and what might they look like in future? And also, what about those services who um, may be RI and have been working very hard to improve, but um, haven't yet had an inspection, or if they have had an inspection, the rating hasn't changed. And brand new services, particularly those who might be in an area where commissioners won't commission from them until they've had an inspection and a rating. Uh, questions of, about that as well. Um, some enthusiasm for the uh, idea of an inspector who's also a coach, um, but also some questions I think that go to um, sometimes the feeling about trust or not. So there was a question which I've answered about um, whether providers would be secretly penalised if they said no to accepting um, somebody in their service. I've answered no, that we support providers to make decisions about admissions to their service and um, there will be no punishment from us, secret or otherwise. Yeah, great. OK, fab. Thank, thank you, Mary. Thank you for all your comments. We'll busily digest all of them. Um, really great challenge about home care and our focus. And I think I think that will be a specific action. Um, Jen, who's on the call, uh, uh, I think we'll take a specific action away about um, infection prevention control and home care. Um, much of the guidance and the tool I think would be relevant for home care, but I think that's a really helpful, healthy challenge to say actually um, that's available for care homes. Um, you could argue, uh, you know, our focus has been on care homes during this pandemic for, for this IPC because of the risk about large numbers of people living together in a communal space. Um, but yes, if I can if I can agree to take away that as a specific action and um, we'll probably look at maybe issuing something in one of my blogs, Jen, um, on that. With regard to keep the ratings, um, what do you think? Um, I think I, I think what I've heard is that ratings are really important and it's a kind of currency that the public understands now. So there would need to be a seriously good argument for, you know, uh, I think, for, you know, moving on from that. I think the conversation about ratings um, that might be interesting to have is can your rating only change as a result of a physical inspection? What would it look like if ratings were decoupled from the act of inspection? And, you know, what if, uh, you know, the intelligence that came in, what if there were a number of virtual calls? What if there were conversations with stakeholders and focus groups that were held? But are, are there other ways that 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 regulator could be given enough assurance that a rating could change without a physical inspection is a is a question um, I think it might be worth be interested in exploring. Um, how much can we as the regulator rely on other people's judgments on bits of bits? So, for example, there are some really fantastically resourced and you know fantastic quality monitoring teams out there that sit in local authorities and CCGs. You know, how how should some of that play into the way that we uh, judge a service? 
I don't know, but I think the I think I would suggest that the ratings outstanding good requires improvement and inadequate are probably a currency that is worth retaining because it makes so much that you know the public uh, it makes sense to the public. But as to how a rating is changed, um, I think it could be interesting to explore what that might look like. Um, and yeah, your point the point about requires improvements working really hard to improve and just their frustration about um, uh, in inspections. As I say, we need to, we absolutely need to prioritise our efforts on where the greatest risk is. If you happen to be an RI service that is, you know, really confident that you get good on a re-rating and you happen to be in a part of the country where there are capacity issues, you might want to have a conversation uh, with us about, about that. But as I say, uh, the priority will always be going out at the moment, uh, is going out to those, those most um, at-risk services. Um, I think that's it. Is there, is there anything else? Um, any other comments from uh, my team about what you've seen that you want us to bring up? Um, anything from you, Jen, that you're... Yeah, I just wanted to highlight um, some very helpfully um, highlighted about home care there, but just to say that we do have some providers on the call from Shared Lives and Supported Living as well, who've also highlighted that the IPC work and that guidance would be useful for the, those groups as well. Um, so I just wanted to, to pick that out of, out of the chat. There's one particular comment that's got a few um, likes there. How will share lives services be inspected as we do not fall neatly under the current guidance? Yeah, OK, so fair. As well. Um, Thanks, Jen. Yeah, and just one around the IPC that I just wanted to pick up because it seemed that there was a bit of anxiety there. Um, we appreciate your support. Providers do not accept residents with a COVID positive test. Does this mean providers will secretly be penalised for not accepting COVID positive because we are not deemed to be following safe IPC measures? So I, I'm, I'm hoping that um, that of what I've said will support providers. I'm, I'm hoping that, um, you know, I, I can only imagine the pressure that providers have come under um, in the last eight months. And I'm hoping that, you know, providers are regulated by us and we as the regulator are saying we back you. We back you to say who you can and can't take. Um, you know, it's your it's always been your final call, but there has been such pressure and there probably will be the pressure's probably seriously started to notch up where, where you are as well around the country. Um, obviously, we all want to work together. We want to collaborate. We want to support people leaving hospital in a timely way or coming into a service if their situation is breaking down, for example, at home. But, um, you know, it's the regulator that comes in and, and judges whether what you're doing is is safe. And I just want you to know you've got our you've got our backing uh, when it comes to, um, you know, making that making that call, recognising all the other pressure that's in, in the, that is and will be in the system as well. For you, you know, if you happen to be a care home provider with a couple of empty beds, um, you know, I know I know the, the pressure will be there, but we have to keep on coming back to um, yeah, um, your, your ability to keep people safe with the with the people that you take into your care. As I say, it's always been the way, but um, I, I just I felt it might have been um, yeah uh, the right time to just make that re restate that really clearly um, as well. Anything else, Jen? So the um, the home care focus IPC, so home care shared lives um, uh, and our IPC guidance will take away, and we can maybe uh, get a bit of a focus on it in a future message out to the sector. Is there anything else, Jen, you want to flag? Just an interesting one on. Um... So the, the Quality Matters initiative and how we were a driving force behind that, and that included a single vision of quality, is that going to be playing into our new strategy as well? Yeah, so um, it absolutely is. And, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I love the, the Quality Matters agenda, the I statements. I just think there's a simplicity to it about how, uh, how we need to work. If you as a sector think that you, it should be even more explicit in, in our strategy and in our approach. Um, I'd love you to say that um, I'm saying it, but it would be uh, far more powerful if uh, a host of our providers came back saying, yeah, nice idea about the strategy, but wouldn't it make sense if it was judged against um, kind of quality matters and uh, making it real eye statements? So um, I'm, a, I'm a massive advocate as well, but um, yeah, tell us that if that's what you think, that would be, that'd be great. Anything else, Jen? That's great. They were the, the main themes coming through um, from there. Fab. And just so many, so many really helpful comments. So um, I'm going to I'm going to start to draw this to um, a close. Um, as I say, if, if possible, so um, you may or may not have seen um, our state of care publication on Friday. Um, 
kind of three headline messages, if I may. Um, one is that there are now 85 percent of social care providers are good or outstanding, which is remarkable because of the two big challenges we've got in the, in the sector that was just absolutely magnified by um, by the pandemic. And they are that we need a long term, long term sustainable funding solution for social care. It's great having all this short term investment, but it doesn't enable commissioners and providers to do that long term planning about what their service should look like in five, 10, 15 years time. And then the third message, so it's remarkable that good and outstanding providers are continuing to increase um, up to 85%. We need long term sustainable funding and we need a new deal for the social care workforce. So I've been saying a lot over the last couple of weeks that um, never before have we talked about social care as much as we're talking about it now. The first 10 weeks of the pandemic, everyone stood on their doorsteps and clapped for care workers. That now needs to translate to the right terms, conditions, career progression, uh, value, training that we need to uh, uh, enable this this profession to be recognised for what it is, which is you know good social care, uh, you know properly changes people's lives, and we need the workforce to be celebrated and rewarded accordingly. So just a flag, state of care published um, last week, and that is what we are uh, we are talking about um, from from where we sit as well. Um, so I mentioned before, get involved. We've got a digital platform, we've got provider bulletins that we will um, get some messaging out to you all about um, uh, home care, shared lives and IPC. And then, uh, and, you know, we've got our Twitter account and I'm also on Twitter as well if you want to um, follow us. And I think that is it. Um, we're doing a few of these, so um, we would really value, this is the first of, I don't know, maybe about 10 of these across the, the health and social care, uh, the, across the different sectors. Really love to hear your thoughts about, did this work? Was it the right pace? Um, uh, how did you find the ability to put comments in and, and get a response, etc.? cetera? So uh, please let us know in the chat uh, whether this was a good use of an hour's hour of your time. And from our perspective, can I just say a massive thank you for joining us? Um, thank you for all your, your contributions and your, your comments. We will uh, take them away and, and digest them to see if there's anything else we need to do differently. And, um, you know, it's... Um, a massive thank you from me. Uh, it's been a really tough year so far and for a workforce that's probably pretty exhausted and has gone through a huge amount of turmoil, uh, everything is gearing back up again and we're, you know, it's feeling like we're in the throes of it all over again, admittedly a whole lot more prepared than we were collectively the first time around. But just um, a massive thank you to you and all your teams for, for the work you do every day and um, take care of yourself. Thank you all. Cheerio. Bye.